Carlos Nelson with Cascade Media Group. And today uh, we have uh, Esquire, Mr. Mickey Dean, and he's going to be talking about uh, reparations. How are you doing uh, this morning, Mickey? Doing well, Carlos. Uh, always glad to be with you on Cascade Media. And hey, Mickey, talk about uh, the reparations issues and where we're at right now. Well, um, to just to just uh, start from where we are now, uh, there's a phrase in the movement that uh, reparations is an issue whose time has come. You know, for a long time, Carlos, and I know uh, I've, I've been with you before talking about reparations. Once upon a time, those of us who support reparations, if we had mentioned this 10, 12 years ago, uh, you sort of get the side out from people. Um, you know, they'll look at you and say, yeah, you know, we deserve reparations, but right now it's a fantasy. Um, what's happened, though, within the last decade or so, I think one of the significant events was in 2014 when Todd Nisi Coates wrote an article in Atlantic Magazine on reparations. It got a lot of attention, and it really brought the subject of, of reparations to the forefront again, and everybody started talking about reparations. The other boost was during the 2020 Democratic presidential campaign uh and this just may have been a campaign ploy but three or four of the candidates said they would support reparations in fact they said they would support the legislation in congress now hr 40 uh to develop the reparations commission and then i think the last thing uh which sparked a lot of attention to a lot of black issues was uh the the fallout from the george floyd uh murder and as you know there was a uh, uh, a lot of activity around the country based on that, and and reparations was another issue that that really got a lot of attention. Uh, it was it was in the aftermath of that that we started a local reparations movement here in Kansas City, developed our Kansas City Reparations Coalition, and uh, we've really been trying to push this issue of reparations locally since that time, and uh, we're gradually uh, having success. We, we're getting more and more people asking about reparations. Uh, we're getting more and more groups asking us to do presentations on reparations. So we've got a ways to go, but the, but the uh, the movement is taking off taking off here locally. All right. So uh, did a little homework last night finally, <laughs> and I looked at and listened to your last interview with us. It was November fifth, twenty twenty, and uh, you had talked about uh, independent black political party. And I wanted to know whether there's been any, any movement on that. And uh, do you really think that uh, black people understand the difference between uh, the, being an independent, uh, uh, ind ind independent black party and what that will do for uh, black people. Well, I'm not. I'm not really sure how that connects with with reparations. Uh, I mean, that, that's kind of a different issue. The Independent Black Party. There are a lot of different perspectives on that. Uh, ironically, uh, this year is the 50th anniversary of the National Black Political Convention in Gary, Indiana. Uh, which, by the way, Queen Mother Moore was at that convention and she talked about reparations, but, uh, and there are a couple of commemorative uh, independent political party events later this year. Uh, but, but you know, I think that's still a, a subject of debate. You know, we have a lot of our politicians still wedded to the Democratic Party. And uh, we have a lot of folks saying that, that you know, that's just not has, has uh, generated very much for us over the years and that we do need an independent political party or even a progressive party that, that may include more than, than Black people, but just something that, to wean progressive people, Black people, progressive people away from the Democratic Party. But that's an issue aside from reparations. That, that uh, yes, it was. Uh, but when I listened to uh, our last interview, uh, we talked about that uh, not extensively, but quite a bit. And uh, I thought bringing that back up because in, repara in reparations, from my perspective, 
we still have to do something about gaining our own political uh, power uh, and our own uh, economic base. And it, to, from, my, from my perspective, I think a lot of uh, African-Americans are interested in the reparations issue. And I'm more like, I think that that's, that's coming along, but where do we go from, from there from an economic perspective? Well, I, I think that, that first of all, um, reparations right now, uh, I, I think mostly is being fought on the legislative front, both uh, uh, nationally with HR 40 in Congress and, uh, and in local governments. We, we, we are working on a proposal now that we're gonna present to the mayor within another week or so. But the, the thing about legislative activity is that you, you, you're gonna need uh, people outside of the black community. For example, in Congress now, you, you need 200 and I believe it's 218 votes to pass anything out of the House of Representatives. Well, we've got about 190 sponsors of HR 40, which is a reparations legislation, which means that there are a, a significant amount of uh, whites, all Democrats, by the way, who support HR 40, who support reparations. Uh, in, in the cities where the most progress have been made with regard to reparations, uh, Evanston, Illinois, Asheville, North Carolina, uh, Providence, Rhode Island, those are predominantly white cities. Um, and and uh, but those are the ones that have made the most progress on, on reparations in, in terms of ordinances um, that have actually produced anything. None of the major cities have, have done that. Now there are some some very significant ordinances, one in Los Angeles, one in San Francisco, that have set up commissions to study reparations. But um, you know, we're if you look at these the heavily black cities, uh, they're still they're still lacking in that regard. So I'm saying all that to say that. You know, even if we had an independent political party to get anything accomplished through the in the legislative field, you're still going to need uh, other folks to ally with you. And uh, uh, and, I, and I think the idea of an independent political party was uh, particularly in local elections, you know, you could you could really generate enough support. But mainly it was it was to have a place to uh, concretize black demands. Aside from other people's demand, what are the black demands? And politically, what should we be fighting for as black people? And then, you know, we can we can look at who's with us and who's not with us. Uh, and reparations as an issue is, is one that we can fight for as black people, but we're going to need other folks to support that. Tell me this: uh, you made a, a real interesting observation that. Uh, on the reparations and uh, power issue, you can do that uh, much easier locally uh, than nationally. What do you think the problem is? Why the black uh, predominantly uh, populations in the big cities, things haven't moved forward as fast as uh, the other cities that you mentioned? I, I think, and, and, and there's no consensus on this, but I think when you have uh, a city that has a progressive administration uh, with regard to um, white legislatures. And then you have a, a black population that is not large enough to really be threatening. In other words, when you start talking about dollars uh, and, and, and how do you support reparatory justice, it, it's a big difference in, in, in a place like Atlanta or Chicago as, as opposed to a place like Everson, Illinois, where you only got about, I think, 12 or 13 percent of the population black. Asheville, I think, less than 20 percent. Providence, even less than that. So I think that that in a lot of those smaller cities that, that have progressive legislative bodies, it, it's, it's not it's not as big a, a heavy a lift to say, let's do something for reparatory justice. Now, remember, municipalities can't really Cover the cover the debt. That's that's really a federal government responsibility, and that's why a lot of the focus is on the federal government. But I think that 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 uh, if, if you're talking about repertory justice, you know, in Atlanta and Chicago, uh, Detroit, you're talking about uh, uh, a lot of dollars, and I think that might frighten some of the the legislators. Even though those cities have have, I think, large. Uh, amounts of blacks in their legislative bodies. It's just that the inertia 
that has been, um, um, it's just been frustrating. And I've talked to people in those cities and they're, they're fighting hard just like we are. Uh, but, but, uh, and they're making progress too, by the way, but uh, it's, it's just a tougher fight for whatever reason. What took place I, when I, I think I called you two weeks ago on, on this reparations issue and something was taking place here in Kansas City, you were going to some, some meetings and, and conferences. What was that all about? Well, I think that, that uh, there was, I, I, and I, I think I remember there was one session uh, that, that Trin, Trinity United Methodist Church held, and, uh, which is a predominantly white congregation and they asked me to come do a presentation on, on, on reparations because what we're trying to do in Kansas City is build a coalition that includes not only black people, but anybody that would support reparations. I think the other issue may have been, uh, the, uh, we had a meeting with the mayor and the mayor has, has basically said that he's willing to establish a commission uh, to study proposals for reparations in Kansas City. What can Kansas City do? And so we're working on that. And as I said earlier, uh, hopefully we'll be able to present that to the mayor, uh, hopefully by the end of this week. And uh, we'll, we'll see what happens from there. And, th and that's basically is, is to look at his Kansas City historically uh, in areas, the five areas, education, healthcare, uh, economics, business development, criminal justice, and, and home ownership to see historically what, is, what, what has Kansas City done not only the government, but institutions and businesses, corporations in Kansas City, what have they done historically to prevent black people from having success in those areas? And, and uh, so we want to understand clearly uh, what the harm has been, who has caused the harm, and then to try to develop some proposals for repertory justice. So that's the purpose of this commission that hopefully uh, uh, we'll get started on setting it up through the mayor's office here in another week or so. Uh, is there anything that our local community can do to help support this effort? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, there's there's going to be, as, as you can imagine, uh, a significant amount of, of opposition uh, to, to, to reparations. And even among Black people, if not opposition to support, the support may not be as, may not be as vigorous as we would like it. So one of the things that, that we're going to really need is, is for people to support our efforts uh, and, and, and really put pressure on our uh, politicians to really get behind this and see what we can do uh, on a local level. Also, once we identify uh, certain entities, for example, in, in, in home ownership, the role that the real estate companies have played uh, uh, with redlining, the role that the uh, financial institutions have played in terms of mortgage lending discrimination over the years. All of those things have, have really set Black people back because, as you know, home ownership is one of the main sources of wealth for most families. And the fact that we've been denied that contributes tremendously to the wealth gap, the tremendous wealth gap that we have between Blacks and whites. So, so a lot of this is going to be having people in the public uh, express support uh, for reparations in ways that, that, that will, that, that, uh, we hope to have more of them in the future, but our role uh, as a coalition really is to is to continue to bring this effort to our people because a lot of black people still really don't fully understand this issue of reparations. They don't understand the history of it. You hear things like, well, that was slavery. That was a long time ago while we're still talking about it. So it's really, really a lot more education that we have to do among our people on, on reparations in order to get them to support. But we will be asking for support uh, as time goes on. Uh, do you have any closing uh, words for our audience? Well, I, I think the main thing is, is, is to understand that um, we, we, we are old, right? In, in addition to all of the free labor uh, that, that black, black people gave during the enslavement period, which by the way, uh, uh, that the, 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 the slave economics played a large role in building the wealth of this country, uh, but it did end there. I mean, not only was there, there, there the enslavement period, but we had uh, uh, decades of Jim Crow, uh, decades of, of discrimination in housing, healthcare. So, so it's been a, continuous, a continuing legacy from slavery that we're looking at in, in terms of uh, reparatory justice. So, I think that that um, 
uh, the wealth gap in this country is a direct result of that. I think that it, it's, uh, I've read studies that say that, because you know, the uh, uh, white household, household wealth is about 10 times black household wealth. And the estimate is that if we just do the type of programs that we do now, civil rights, affirmative action, empowerment zones, et cetera, it would take over 200 years to close that wealth gap. Most of us don't have 200 years. So we need something uh, uh, that, that's, that's uh, very, very specifically targeted to closing that wealth gap. And reparations is really the only thing that we see that could do that. Um, and, and, and so that's why we, we have to convince people that this is something that they really have to fight for. And it's something that really can happen because it's beginning to happen in bits and pieces around the country. I've uh, left this out and maybe uh, I asked you for closing, but I, I'd like for you to give an example of, of how reparations would work because different people uh, have seen different uh, explanations of what does that look like? Well, you know, the, the, when, you, when you mentioned reparations, the first thing that people think of is a check, right? Uh, but but reparations can take so many different forms. For example, Evanston, Illinois, is the only city so far that has actually begun to pay reparations. What they focused on was home ownership. Now, one of the things that was beneficial to Evanston was that at the time that the, the reparations movement was taking place, the state of Illinois legalized uh, cannabis sales, and so so basically the city council there said that they would take ten percent of the sales tax on cannabis and devote that to rep reparations. So they didn't really have to dig into their, their current city budget. So that was an advantage that they had. And what they've done is, is that they've identified uh, eligible uh, black citizens in Everson, Illinois. They focused on home ownership and they've already been, been uh, started giving out amounts uh, $25,000 each to eligible black families, either to put a down payment on a home or to uh, repair an existing home. So that this is uh, one way that, that we've seen reparations being paid in, in the area of home ownership. It could be in, in, it could be in um, uh, education and scholarships. Uh, it could be in, in um, grants to businesses. I mean, there, there's just so many different ways that reparations could be. It could be a form of tax relief. Uh, so there's just, just lots of possibilities uh, for reparations. And that's what these commissions are gonna be studying because it's way more than a check. Not to say that that's not a part of it, but it's way more than that. Yeah, that's that's what, uh, from your conversation now, it's given me even a clearer picture. It's a uh, hundred ways to do this. And do you think that they're, uh, in the future, if they come up with uh, a solution, it's gonna be a, a one size fit all? No, I don't, I don't think so. I, I think that, that, that um, uh, and it's really on two levels for for the federal government, HR uh, forty. Uh, that that's a uh, a commission that would look at all of the possibilities because the federal government has the major responsibilities for cities. Cities are probably going to end up focusing on one area or another. Like for instance, Evanston focused on home ownership. Uh, they did they uh, uh, they didn't just hand out checks. They said okay, twenty five thousand dollars per family. The eligible family for home ownership. So you could see it, you know, in in, in uh, cities focusing on on different things. But th there's just a, a, I mean, we just have to be creative in terms of what reparatory justice will ultimately look like. There are a lot of ideas floating around, and and each city, as far as local reparations go, is going to have to decide, um, you know, what might be the most feasible for that city. The federal government, though, in HR forty needs to really look at everything, the whole, the whole gamut of possibilities. Well, it was, uh, I'm stealing Jim Watts's line again. Uh, it was a plum pleasing pleasure having you on the show. And we look forward to you uh, updating our community on, on what's going on in the future. And as we always say in closing, when you invest in your community,